of mankind. A greater power ruled the earth, the planets, and the stars. Now, four and a half billion years after the making of the earth, the door to his realm will be opened for the first time. Tonight, many will be let down the path to the dark side. You, as one of the chosen ones, can only willingly undergo that what is about to happen. Let us introduce someone that hides in the Master's shadow. Someone that has given up life as freedom for something way more powerful. Tonight, he is our Master of Ceremony. And he has been given the name of... Ruffian. Tonight I've been chosen! Chosen to stand in my Master's shadow! And I've been given the task to select the demon and exclude the angels. Let my voice guide you. No one has seen the face of the dark side before. Only few souls are strong enough to look into his eyes. If you think you are one of them, get ready, for he is here. first demon to perform on the altar of the dark side is a ghost who has haunted the dance floors for many years. Our Lord of Darkness demanded that he open this mythical gathering to show you his special skills that weaken the mind in the first stages of Path's Descent. Religions have tried to warn you in their holy books. Teachings of peaceful tribes have told their stories about the truth. All of this has proven to be in vain. still aren't convinced of his existence. You still haven't felt the strength of the dark side. Worth 
world's greatest power is the power to surprise, to strike when everybody is least expecting it. Some of the Chosen Ones may have seen him work before, but never on the Master's great altar. He is one of the most promising demons from the underworld. Very slowly, you have been lured into his domain. Now that you are here, you will meet your greatest fears. The Lord will see to it that you experience your own darkest emotions. Don't hesitate to let go. The longer you fight, the stronger he gets. Everybody has a dark side. It's strong. It's overpowering. It is in charge. And the worst thing is... You all have it in you. Descendant is one of the favorite pets of our master. His talent to spread fear is legendary. And he is honored to fulfill this important place on the master's ceremony. Every time you were alone, every time you were asleep, he is always there. He dominates your nightmares. He controls you every step you take. He is in the earth. He flows through the air. He floods in water. He blows in the wind. And he burns in the flames. were born as angels. The Lord's next performers underestimated the power of the dark side and tried to escape its wrath. Their job is to enchant large crowds with penetrating sounds and piercing rhythms. Now they are servants of the underworld. The Lord 
advantage lies in his ability to influence the weak-minded. His power is stronger than the biggest supernova. Your brain and willpower are not able to resist this supreme being's wishes. that even impresses our master. When this happens, that one is given the chance to perform on the Lord's most impressive stage. In the tradition of the underworld, the apprentice is introduced by a gifted and well-respected dark angel. the persuading powers of the dark side. During the last 10 hours, your mind has been set to follow the path to oblivion. You were doomed before you even got here. I took possession. To finish the job, our Lord saved his most fearsome servant till the end. You have been weakened by all his predecessors. It has been a long struggle. But in the end, the Dark Lord lured you all into his kingdom. As of now, you are doomed souls. Caged behind the master's bars. You are his slaves. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a good time in the night. It was Climax 2006, and it was with man DJ Promo! Beyonce is the hottest artist on the world stage in 2013. She followed up her lip-syncing scandal at President Barack Obama's inauguration with a spellbinding performance at the 2013 Super Bowl. During Beyonce's Super Bowl appearance, the Twitter universe lit up with people claiming that Beyonce was flashing the Illuminati or Devil's Triangle. The concern was so great that mainstream media outlets tried to explain it away as simply a reference to her husband Jay-Z's record company. Of course, this simplistic approach ignored the fact that Jay-Z and Beyonce are aware that the symbol has a layered meaning and occultic or Luciferian connotations. In fact, they are not only aware of this, but as you can see, Beyonce's husband Jay-Z promotes the occult aspect of the Eye of Horus and the Triangle through his rock-aware apparel. 
Sadly, countless young people are wearing the Eye of Horus and have been introduced to the darkest of occult symbology through Jay-Z and his Rockaway Empire. Here we see a shot of a ritual of the Order of the Temple of Astarte, a chartered Crowleyan organization which admittedly contacts demons in their rituals using the same symbol that Jay-Z, Beyonce and so many others are using. Here we also see Satanist Anton LaVey who wrote the Satanic Bible and started the Church of Satan using the Eye of Horus or the triangle symbol in his Satanic rituals. Here we see Satanist Aleister Crowley who promoted the sacrifice of innocent children and who signed his name the Beast 666 wearing the Eye of Horus in the triangle, one of the main symbols for the Age of Horus and the coming reign of Antichrist. Crowley's favorite Antichrist maxim was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Do what thou wilt as opposed to doing God's will became the backbone of Crowleyanity. Here we see Jay-Z with do what thou wilt emblazoned across one of his shirts. Notice also next to Lester Crowley is a book with a circle and a pentagram on the front cover. One of the most basic symbols used in the occult and Satanism to contact demonic beings as a sphere of receptivity to Satan and demonic forces often resulting in demonic possession. Jay-Z, Beyonce's husband, knows what it means to be possessed by spirits as he admits here claiming that he is a modern day Frank Sinatra and that he is possessed by spirits. I feel like, you know, Sinatra, you know, in my time, you know, modern day Sinatra, so, you know, I'm trying to live up to that, you know. I get possessed by, by the spirits. I get possessed by, by the spirits. When we understand how the circle and pentagram are used at times in the occult and Satanism and take a closer look at Beyonce's Super Bowl performance, it becomes even more chilling. Near the beginning of her performance, we see Beyonce fall to the ground into what becomes a circle of light. It's interesting that after Beyonce lies down in the circle, we then see appear an inverted pentagram. The inverted pentagram in Satanism often signifies the goat-headed depiction of Satan himself. And here we see Beyonce with the inverted pentagram with the goat-headed Baphomet when she introduced the spirit of Sasha Fierce, who she claimed possessed her. Here we see the goat-headed satanic Baphomet on Beyonce's ring. And here we see at Beyonce's Super Bowl appearance, one of her dancers, adorned with an upside-down pentagram, worked into her apparel. Beyonce, entering the circle with the inverted pentagram, appears to be her way of signaling that she's allowing the spirit named Sasha Fierce, the entity that she claimed possesses her and channels her during performances, to take control of her body. Beyonce has even worked Sasha Fierce into her wardrobe. The Daily Mail described her Super Bowl outfit as, quote, fierce and sexy, which was fitting for the entity Sasha Fierce. The man behind the design, Ruben Singer, says his creation of Beyonce was inspired by female warrior gods in Norse mythology. Incredibly, you can see what appears to be the goat-headed satanic Baphomet worked into Beyonce's bizarre attire. Later in Beyonce's Super Bowl performance, we see Beyonce represented by the Hindu goddess Kali. Kali is often associated with darkness and death and depicting with the bloody heads on a necklace of her slain. Kali is a fitting image for Sasha Fierce as she is a counterpart of Shiva, the god of destruction. Beyonce also employs the Gemini twins, seen taking up a huge part of the stage. In Babylonian mythology, the Gemini twins represented, quote, the god of plague and pestilence, who was king of the underworld, end quote. It may be that what Beyonce is depicting in the Gemini symbols, which resemble her, is a spiritual synthesis with Sasha Fierce, which would signify full-blown demonic possession. Beyonce has admitted in the past that she looked forward to the time when her and Sasha Fierce would be indistinguishable. Beyonce has expressed her desire to communicate the vibe of spirit possession in her music. She claims that she even wants a whole video to feel possessed. I want to be so wild, almost possessed. And I want the whole video to feel possessed. I want the whole video to feel possessed. Beyonce may have found more than she bargained for and ended up getting possessed by a spirit. Rolling Stone stated in one article on Beyonce, quote, A woman possessed, Beyonce is gripped by a spirit so powerful it even has a name, Sasha, end quote. Beyonce said in an extra interview, quote, I think Sasha Fierce is part of me. That's why the name of the album was I Am Sasha Fierce. She goes on to say, she lives within me. I think Sasha Fierce is a part of me. That's why the name of the album was I Am Sasha Fierce, because it's all the same. She lives within. Beyonce claims that she is typically more reserved and cannot sing with as much power. But when this spirit entity possessed her body, it energized her vocal ability and caused her performances to skyrocket. I'm really kind of shy and not really shy, but more reserved and um, nothing like Sasha. Got me looking so crazy right now, baby. Got me
But I guess I wouldn't be very entertaining on the stage. So Sasha comes out <laughs> and she's fearless. You know, she can she can do things that I cannot do when I'm in rehearsal. I mean, I can try, but then it just doesn't happen. I can sing notes and sing strong and do all these things that when I'm just by myself, I can't do. And I remember right before I performed, I raised my hands up. And it was kind of the first time I, I felt something else come into me. Felt something else come into me. Strangely, Beyonce in the past has depicted herself on stage as picking up a coin with the image of her face on one side and the image of Sasha Fierce on the other. When flipping the coin, if it comes up Sasha Fierce, she then allows the spirit entity of Sasha to take control of her body. Beyonce appears to be possessed by an evil and perverted spirit of harlotry. Apparently the spirit entity Sasha Fierce leads her into perverse and raunchy sexual behavior that Beyonce would never do if not under Sasha Fierce's diabolical influence. Beyonce has admitted, quote, When I see a video of myself on stage or TV, I'm like, who is that girl? That's not me. I wouldn't dare do that. And I wouldn't like Sasha if I met her off stage, end quote. This demonic entity is more than some alter ego, but a spirit that possesses Beyonce's body. In fact, Beyonce seems to black out and be unconscious of her body when this evil spirit takes control. She describes it this way, quote, I have out-of-body experiences. If I cut my leg, if I fall, I don't even feel it. I'm so fearless. I'm not aware of my face or my body, end quote. Beyonce says, quote, it's like a blackout. When I'm on stage, I don't know what the blank happens. I am gone, end quote. She has said recently, quote, I'm more powerful than my mind can even digest and understand, end quote. Notice in Beyonce's Super Bowl appearance that as she's emerging from the circle with the inverted pentagram, her face becomes distorted, as though she has now given her body over to the spirit she identified elsewhere as Sasha Fierce. Here we see that the normally sweet appearing Beyonce now looks like a different person, more like a man than a woman. Throughout the rest of her Super Bowl performance, Sasha Fierce's mean man face will appear as much as Beyonce's. Beyonce has admitted that this spirit is not a friendly spirit, hence the name Fierce. Of course, God's word, the Bible, reveals that when it comes to fallen angels, only demonic entities possess human beings. From the time she enters the circle with the pentagram, Beyonce's face morphs repeatedly into a demonic and evil sneer. So horrific were many of the faces that Beyonce manifested that her publicist told BuzzFeed that they wanted them to remove pictures that they considered unflattering to Beyonce, some of which you are seeing here. Satan's desire has always been to be worshipped in place of God the Creator. In Isaiah chapter 14, we read that Satan wanted to be like the Most High God and wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God. In Matthew chapter 4, Satan asked Jesus to bow down and worship him. Jesus responded and said, Get behind me, Satan. It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and serve him only. Sadly, this is ultimately what Satan and the demonic realm want. Here we see Beyonce, or Sasha Fierce, give the creepy request of asking the crowd to reach out to her so she could feel their energy. Everybody put your hands towards me. Everybody, I'm gonna feel your energy. Wave your hands with me, come on. Tragically, the crowd is clueless as to who they are praising. May God help us to wake up to the fact that his word declares that we are not wrestling against mere flesh and blood, but against Satan and the demonic spirit hierarchy that are hell bent on bringing as many people to the lake of fire with them as they can. While Satan wants your soul damned, please understand that God loves you and states that he does not want you to perish and go to hell. Like in China to this day, the Chinese worship gods in their villages. And if the village starts doing poor economically, they'll go look for a village that's doing well economically and they'll throw away the gods that aren't benefiting them and they'll bring the gods from the village that's doing well economically. It's a very pragmatic type of idolatry. So this is what the, these people were doing. They were worshipping all of these idols. 
And the the Mithraic teaching had was was the 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 Mithraic God was born on December 25th. This is in their own what the research has been done. Born on the December 25th, he was called Sol Invictus, the conquering sun god. The sun god. And this is why Christians worship on Sunday, not S-O-N. S-U-N. It's not the son of God. It's Sunday, the day of soul. The day of the sun god. And this is important. And it's going to be connected with the idea of the Messiah Dajjal because the Messiah Dajjal is also a sun god. The sun god, they believed, was the giver of life. In the same way the sun gives life to plants through photosynthesis as we know in biology now. They, they believed that the sun god would also give life after death. People would die, they would be resurrected. In the same way that Mithra, who kills himself, he does an act of self-immolation and kills himself for the sins of mankind. He becomes a scapegoat. This is Mithra's act. He had 12 disciples. The disciples represented the 12 zodiacal constellations, right? There are 12, you know, in horoscope, which we do not believe in. And Muslims that, I saw an ad in a Muslim paper of a Arraf. You know what Arraf is in Arabic? Arraf. It's like an astrologer, somebody diviner that does that. And it said, Arraf wa shi'ari al amana wa thiqa. This guy said, I'm an astrologer and my, my uh, to their book was commanded to kill the Arrafin and the Munajimin. The Jews don't believe in that. But the, 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 the Mithras believed in this 12 zodiacal constellations and each one of them represented a disciple. There is no number given of the Hawariyun. There's no number that says they were 12 in the Islamic tradition. And, and Jesus, quote unquote, making 13, which is what the Christians call the devil's number very interesting. I mean, they're so superstitious, they don't even have a 13th floor. In, I don't know if they do that here, but in the United States, you go from 12 to 14 in a, in a building. They don't have a 13th floor. So this is their number, they call that the devil's number, 13. And this is the number of Mithra and his disciples. Now what happens with Mithra, Paul literally takes the Mithraic teaching and embellishes it with aspects of the Christian teaching. He took, what he took was the death of Mithra, who, who transforms himself in the Roman Empire is where the Vatican now stands. This is historical evidence. It is where the Vatican now stands. The mother of Mithra was worshipped. The mother of Mithra was worshipped. So this was all part of this uh, redaction of the Judaic teaching, the Semitic Christianity becomes this Mithraic reality, completely transformed, completely altered until it is unrecognizable. Saint Augustine and the Christians were so bothered by the similarities between Christianity and Mithraism that they would not mention Mithraism by its name. They called Mithra the fellow in the cap, the Phrygian cap. They wouldn't even mention him by his name. And Saint Augustine says in his writings that he met a priest from the fellow in the cap and he said to St. Augustine, you know, our, our man is a Christian also. In other words, it's really the same teaching and doctrine. The Christians completely wiped out the books, the temples, all of the evidence of Mithraism was completely wiped out. And that's why it's only recently, in the last hundred years, that scholars, anthropologists, and uh, archaeologists have been digging up all of this stuff and finding out about this teaching. Extraordinary. I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. Hey everyone, it's the Vigilant Christian Mario, and you're here for another edition of Illuminati Media Expose. 
In today's video, I'm going to be exposing Family Guy. Now, this is one of the most satanic, blasphemous, God-hating things that I've ever exposed on this channel. And if you're familiar with my series, you do know that I've exposed a lot of satanic things um, that are found in the modern-day media. Now, this one tops it all. So to my brothers and sisters in the faith, I do need to warn you, this one will probably make your stomach turn. It is so God-hating and blasphemous against Christ and God. Um, it's actually mind-blowing. But the reason that I, I feel called to expose this is for the loss. They need to recognize and uh, understand that there is a huge system of conditioning that is set up against them to in impose within them at a very subconscious level a hate for God. Okay, it is no surprise when we look at the statistics um, of God believers in my generation, Generation X and under, that the charts have completely plummeted. That belief in God is pretty much non-existent in my generation. And I'm going to suggest to you that it is largely in part due to the satanic influence of this type of media. Okay, uh, so in today's video, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about just how God-hating this is, and I'm going to just show you and... Uh, Let's get right into it. So the first thing I want to point out here is the fact that it's a cartoon. Now this is a very effective way to lure children in especially. Um, you know you have uh, Family Guy, Simpsons, Ren and Stimpy, um, you know shows like that that are cartoons and as a child you think well cartoons are created for me but they're not. Okay so what happens is kids actually get lured in more easily to watching shows like this. Okay because you know most of the, the shows kids watch are cartoons. So these are cartoons too. Um, so it lures your kids in. But brothers and sisters and everyone out there this is not um, for children, period, okay? Um, and if you're allowing your children to watch this stuff, shame on you. This is pure satanic garbage that is going to manipulate their minds and their ideologies about uh, God and, and the truth. Um, and you shouldn't do that to them. So the first thing I want to pull up here is just the resemblance of Family Guy to um, The Simpsons. So what it is is the illuminated ones, the power that be, the desire to corrupt society, they utilize, um, you know, shock. Okay, so that's why Madonna back in the 70s, you know, it was outrageous what she's doing. And nowadays it wouldn't be even close to being outrageous. So now we have Lady Gaga who's pushing that envelope. Okay, just like we had The Simpsons who back in the day, that was a crazy cartoon people... And Christians were like, that's satanic, we shouldn't be listening to that, it shouldn't even be allowed on television. Now it's completely socially acceptable, it's been one of the most popular shows on television. So now they need to come and push the envelope even further, because it's never going to stop. This is only going to stop when we have the complete, immoral or the complete moral collapse of society, and everyone is now just conditioned to be completely immoral, hateful, and evil. Okay, that's what they're trying to do, and that's what they're doing very successfully in our societies. Okay, you can just look at the fact that 50 years ago, Elvis Presley was shaking his hips on television, and that was an outrage. And now, nowadays, you got Lady Gaga parading on MTV and dressed in nothing more than police uh, tape, and that's nothing. No big deal. Okay, so how far does this go? At what point do we stand up and say enough is enough? Okay, um, because... It, they're not going to stop pushing the envelope. Uh, so that's why I'm here to wake people up and uh, hopefully you can recognize and uh, protect your families from this evil influence uh, that the powers that be, the media, is perpetuating on your kids and yourself as well. So let's get right into it even more here. The, what I want to point out here is just the fact that this show revolves around coarse jokes. And in Ephesians 5, chapter 4, it says, Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talks, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. So us Christians have nothing, we should have nothing to do with coarse jokes, okay, and foolishness, and that's all this show is about, it's just pure foolishness, it's about farts, and uh, just stupidity, it's the lowest level of humanity expressed in comedy, okay, that's exactly what it is, we're living at the most low standards, until society is nothing more than just a bunch of Homer Simpsons, and Peter's running around, Okay, that's what they want. They want a bunch of beer drinking, brain dead men who can't think for themselves, who all they do is watch television and are a drone. That's exact, and they're being very successful. Just look at the men around you, and you're going to see that eighty percent of them are now conditioned to become that fool. Okay, who sits there and, and has no, in my opinion, has nothing inside, nothing to live for, and is nothing but a shallow, empty shell. 
Um, so, brothers and sisters, just separate yourself from this type of joking and this type of uh, mindset. It's just low-level stuff. Um, so what I want to pull up here is an article that actually shows that Family Guy was named the worst show for young audiences. So I'm not the only one saying this. There's a lot of other uh, parental groups out there who recognize this, but obviously no one cares. Everyone looks at us, oh, you're just a bunch of crazy people taking things too seriously. No, we're the ones who are standing up because we recognize that if this continues, we will see the complete moral collapse of society and people will be stealing and killing and uh, there will be no structure or order left in society. It's going to be pure anarchy. So we recognize that that's not a good thing and that we should stand up for what is right so that we can maintain the structures um, that are in place as of right now okay um, so there you go no surprise it's named one of the worst shows for kids and if you're letting your children watch this shame on you stop that okay you should have more discernment to know that this stuff is not right this type of comedy is evil and satanic now I'm going to focus in to show you just how much they blaspheme God so here you have on your screen an image of God sitting on his cloud so they use the stereotypical satanic Hollywood image of God, which is the man in the beard with the uh, sitting on the clouds, you know, it's, they try, what they do is because they're so satanic and they're after your belief system and the conditioning of it, especially in regards to God, since they're God haters, they make him look as much as a fairy tale as they possibly can. Oh, he's just some old man sitting in the cloud. Okay. And you constantly see this, the Simpsons do it, um, you know, all bunch of shows do it. And this is again, to just manipulate and brainwash you so that you don't believe in God. Now I'm just going to run some things uh, through some things that the character does in the show and like I said brothers and sisters I do apologize but I just want to show you the level of blasphemy of what we're seeing here in the media today. So in the Bible God created the universe with his breath okay now um, in this episode, he actually created the universe by his bodily gases. Okay, this is disgusting. It's disrespectful. All right, it's uh, completely backwards and evil and satanic. And it does not surprise me because it comes from satanic evil people. Okay, uh, he even goes on in, in an episode, that same episode, to arm wrestle the guy. You know, showing that God isn't some supreme Lord God, pure light. He's just another guy with a beard, an old man who wants to arm wrestle. You know, he's got a sniper rifle and he shoots people. Uh, you know, he even has a job as a receptionist in one episode. Um, and even more blasphemy is he uses his powers in some episodes to pick up young women. Okay, so this is disgusting. Um, I can't believe that they would even show this. Uh, our God is nothing like this. They even show him in a hovercraft spaceship flying around looking all cool, you know, uh, sitting there with, on a phone with his girlfriend in bed, you know, insinuating that, you know, he's had sexual relationships with her um, and just disgusting, sick things. One of the most disgusting things that I discovered was an episode where uh, he shows Adam and Eve and God behind the tree has pornography. Okay, now because the main audience of Family Guy are immoral people, immoral people don't have a problem with pornography. In fact, they enjoy it. It's one of their pleasures in life. Um, so what they're trying to subconsciously program you in this image is that the knowledge of good and evil is something pleasurable that God has hidden from us. Okay, why would they do that? Because they're satanic and because they want to influence you to be a God hater at the very subconscious levels. They even go and commercialize them and you can actually buy dolls uh, of God and there's even one where he's drinking a beer. Uh, so it's just pure blasphemy. Now, again, going even more. So I want you to pay attention here. The picture I brought up on the left of Brian's head, you see the Illuminati eye in the pyramid. And right to the, the other side of his head is the God delusion. Okay, now why is that? Because the illuminated ones, the symbol that that represents, the Illuminati are satanic. They go to Bohemian Grove to practice Babylonian satanic blood sacrifice and rituals. All right. So, of course, their intent and their goal is to manipulate you so that you do not believe in God. OK, and that's why it's there. Just put two and two together. They even push it further in other episodes. She says we have to destroy everything that's harmful to God. And the first book that they throw in is logic for first graders. Ho, ho, ho. Stupid Christians can't even think. Oh, a first grader can think more than them. This is an attack against the intelligence behind the gospel. And let me tell you, there is more intelligence behind the gospel than there is anything else. Everything else is foolishness. OK, you think you come from monkeys and all this stuff. This is because the systems that be are manipulating your mind and shows like this even further ingrain that in you, 
Okay, so come on, people. Now, they move on to attack our, uh, our Savior, okay, the one who came and gave himself on the cross. Of course, he's not indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God and, and able to do miracles and, and wonders because of that. He's just nothing more than a magician, okay? And you see that in the episode. He's just uh, doing some magic tricks. And if you're familiar with Illuminati symbolism, you're going to recognize here that he in this, that scene, he was shown flashing the 666 symbol, okay? Um, so just blaspheming God. And again, here's another picture of him in the... In, in, um, the clouds, quote unquote, heaven, again, making heaven like some fairy tale out there, not a, an actual real place, just some fantasy, so that, you know, you don't really want, to, you can't really believe in it. Um, they show you this image, he's not the only God in heaven. Do you see how satanic this is? Because the gospel says that Jesus Christ is the one and only true God, okay? Him and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, what they're trying to impose in this picture is to show you, oh no, you know, Krishna's there and all other gods are up in heaven. Well, this isn't true, brothers and sisters and everyone else listening, okay? Uh, this is just an absolute satanic lie. Um, and it has nothing to do with the truth. Uh, then, you know, they have episodes of him where he's behind uh, the desk over here. He's um, working at a, a rock store, a rock star company. And if you notice, all the satanic symbolism that's found, rock and roll is the, the devil's music, okay? So, obviously, he's, you know, being blasphemed in this way. He ends up in jail in another episode, um, shooting guns and ending up on some big adventure and action story and oh just just blasphemy to, to no avail um, now here's another point that I made you know they show you heaven it's in the clouds so of course they got to show you uh, the lake of fire and the concept of judgment um, in a way that again is just a fairy tale oh look at the devil he's sitting there with his two little horns and his little cape and the fiery dungeon of hell so this again is mind manipulation brothers and sisters Okay, and of course, the Christian character in the Bible is Peter's father, who's stubborn, closed-minded, just smacks people over the head with their Bible. So again, another attack against the body of Christ and what we stand for. So everyone, just to recap, this stuff is satanic, evil, and it's just designed to manipulate your minds. The powers that be are illuminated, dark men who are at at all costs, trying to manipulate and condition you so that you hate God. Don't let it happen. Don't be that foolish, okay? It's an obvious system. Go back and check out my entire Illuminati media series. You're going to see this isn't just Family Guy. This is everywhere. This is in all the movies, okay? Even a movie, go watch my Jim Carrey uh, thing, has sub subconscious uh, Gnostic theology ingrained into it. Okay, so this is a deep system of propaganda set up against you. So if you're going to come here and just watch this one video and go, oh, this is just nonsense, it's nonsense to do that. You need to go back and watch all eight other hours of my material and wait for me to finish producing the other 150 hours that I could produce simply on this satanic media that is conditioning you. So this is the Vigilant Christian saying, God bless each and every one of you. Stay vigilant and do not let this satanic garbage influence you or your children. God bless. Now again, as we said, we're not sure what caused this. Um, it could possibly, and we emphasize possibly, have been a ground impact of a scud. It could have been a ground impact of a patriot, or it could have been the result of debris falling between the two of them. We just don't know right now, but we do know that at least two scud missiles incoming were fired at Riyadh, and according to the Saudi military, they were both shot down. Charles Jaco, CNN, reporting live from Saudi Arabia. was almost exactly two hours ago when the sirens went off here in Saudi Arabia. Where we are in eastern Saudi Arabia, there was no problem. However, there was an intercept elsewhere near the capital city, Riyadh. We've got some videotape of that you can take a look at right now. Hi, Atlanta. We're about to have a short course in missile identification. This is a Scud. You can tell it by its distinctive label. Now, when the missile is launched, the first thing you look for is the plume sticking out behind it. Now, when you detect this, you can tell it's been launched. You Thank you. The graffiti on it? Yeah, show me graffiti. <laughs> Larry King show or bust. <laughs> look at this. Look at look. Look at this. Look, look, at, this. look, at, look, look at this shit. Look at. Believe that. Let me say hi. 
the top ten things about Saudi Arabia. Maybe we could shorten the list to five. <laughs> oh, God. Geopolitics by Dan Quayle. <laughs> <laughs> Je suis un journaliste américain. <laughs> Wolf. 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 <laughs> oh, I love this country so much. You guys just don't have a clue. Well, Cheryl, it was almost exactly two hours ago when the sirens went off here in Saudi Arabia. Where we are in eastern Saudi Arabia, there was no problem. Now, let me just size my mask and fit it for a second, just like I always do. Stand by, please. All clear. They're... Oh, what are they saying? Are they saying all clear? Yes, ma'am. Were they saying all clear down there just now? Okay. All clear. All clear. At the end was a false alarm. Got that, Atlanta? Standing down now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get my hamburger and my coffee. Good. Uh, we just got the all clear. Now. All clear. Every time I order something, this happens. All clear. Thank you. Yeah. Jesus Christ. I'm starting to get real bothered by all this. Boy, did I almost look stupid. <laughs> Charles Jaco, CNN, reporting live from Saudi Arabia. No, wait a minute. Whoa, hold it, homeboy. I'm the talent here, you dig? <gasps> a couple of explosions, what may have been uh, an outgoing Patriot... Uh, ground-to-air missile, uh, some reported air bursts that may, may have been an intercept of an incoming Scud missile. We're really not sure. All we know is that the uh, air raid sirens have gone off, and we've heard the uh, outgoing roar of at least uh, one Patriot missile. We've heard some sort of air burst. We can't tell where it was from where we are right now. Uh, we're waiting to see what's happening. As you can hear, the air raid sirens are still going off around us. People are, uh, strangely enough, used to it. This is the first one of these attacks that's taking place early in the morning, but they're uh, not showing you anything other than uh, what we've got now. What did you see there? Is that a missile going out? No. Uh, we're, not, we're not quite sure. We can't show you anything else than what we're seeing right now uh, because of uh, military regulations. We are not allowed to show you uh, where the missiles might be going, what direction they might be flying in where the airburst might be taking place. There's obviously something going on. Uh, we heard another dull roar that shook things a little bit, and we're waiting to see what else is going on. Right now, that's about all we know, that something is happening. We're hearing pops and things shaking. But uh, people are staying relatively, relatively uh, calm around here. People evacuated in an orderly way to the shelters, but apparently there is something going on. The, uh, uh, Patriot missiles, we're assuming their Patriots have gone outbound, and we've heard some explosions, uh, and uh, that's uh, that's about it uh, for right now. We'll get back to you when we know something else. Something is happening here, and we're watching, we're scanning the skies for something else uh, coming in, but uh, right now we uh, can't uh, see much of anything, and frankly, this is what we can show you on television right now because of uh, military restrictions from both the uh, Saudis and uh, the U.S. Uh, CD, if you need to take cover, I notice uh, that you've got your gas mask in your hands. If you need we, to put it on, we, we please have, do so. If you need to take cover, have, please do so. Have, uh, if, you are able, if you are able to take a question, uh, did you think that the possible threat would be over because it is now morning there? It's what, well, just after the, 6 o'clock in the morning? The, yeah, the whole thing is everyone assumed that the threat would be over because it was uh, early morning. But the thing about Saddam Hussein is that he has never done the expected. And right now we have, uh, you know, once again been uh, surprised with the unexpected, um, an air raid, a, an apparent attack, although we can't say what the outgoing missiles hit at approximately 20 after 7 in the morning Saudi Arabian time. Um, all the other attacks have occurred from 10 o'clock at night till four three four in the morning this is the first one to take place uh, in eastern saudi arabia during the daylight hours now that sound you hear behind me is the uh hotel richard thicker it's not the uh, national Me by afternoon so people are looking up in the sky scanning the skies to see what they can see do we see much of anything out there can we, can we see 
much of anything. Okay, well, apparently there was, there was, yeah, there was some word of, uh, of uh, outgoing. Again, there, we cannot be specific about the direction. All right, we are now led to understand that there are also firings in another city in Saudi Arabia. Uh, CNN's Carl Rochelle is, is here with me. He just came up. Uh, Carl, I know we can't be very specific given these restrictions, but uh, within those parameters, what did you see? Well, what I saw, I, I didn't see anything hit. I looked very, almost straight above us. There is a vapor trail coming from my right to my left, and there's a cloud of uh, something. It looks like it might have been an explosion, a cloud. Uh, oh, I'd say... It, it, He's uh, putting on a gas mask. There hasn't been any gas dropped here that we can tell. You uh, smell anything? No. Oh. You, probably, you may smell some of the fumes from uh, a, uh, a missile exhaust going off. The yeah, missiles right. use a rocket, a cordite, some sort of burning. Uh, we just heard a little, little thump just then. But uh, I have to apologize for that. I, I thought I lifted something and felt momentarily uh, dizzy. You're more experienced in <laughs> military affairs than I am, but it might have been a little... Um, gas from the uh, from the rocket exhaust. There well, apparently wasn't anything. A lot of people had the respirators on just in case. And, and uh, again, you uh, you run to get down here. You, uh, in my case, uh, jumped out of bed, uh, hearing the air raid warning go on. You run down three flights of stairs to get out of here. It's probably a hundred yards. You hyperventilate a little bit, and you're nervous. Uh, one thing, one thing we have to point out, just so people won't think people are panicking. Most people are in their shelters. They've taken cover in their shelters, and in the time. We've been in Saudi Arabia. I've not seen any evidence of panic in the streets or people running around. Going up. People are not exactly taking this as a matter of course, but there's been no wholesale panic or anything. People are, are taking for orderly precautions to deal with uh, the stuff that's going on right now. Okay, I, again, everything seems to be quiet. What I saw, uh, when I walked down, when I came running down, someone had said there, there is a hit upstairs over our heads, right straight up, up, up above us. And I looked up, and you could see the vapor trail, the contrail that's made by an aircraft or a rocket at high altitude, and there was a round puff of smoke uh, that indicated something happened at that point, uh, a lot of smoke. It could be a hit from one of the Patriots taking down a, a Scud missile inbound, or taking down an aircraft, for that matter. But right now, where we are, we have absolutely seen nothing happen. A little boom one time, a small boom, could have been the sound traveling from high on. That's not actually confirming that anything happened. We don't know that there is a hit or uh, anything. We're just telling you what we think and what we see at this point. The air raid sirens are running. The air raid is going on. Could very well be something has happened, but uh, we're all safe right here. The reason I'm wearing a helmet is because it's easier and safer to put it on your head than it is to carry it around in your hand. If you're just trying to be prudent, uh, CD is, uh, is carrying his gas mask with him. I have mine strapped on at my side. Uh, you'll get some indication that there is gas, and one of the indications that there has been gas there be an explosion pretty close to you. There has to be a way to deliver it. As far as we know, uh, they, uh, they have not yet delivered any in a, uh, in a rocket vehicle, in a Scud-type vehicle down in this area or anywhere else. Uh, could happen, but there should be plenty of warning on that. Yeah, Carl, and again, I have to uh, apologize for the audience for yelling gas and putting the gas mask on, but what happened is Carl explained is sometimes when the propellant goes off, I believe that's what it would be, you get this whiff of something, I felt momentarily choked up and dizzy and thought, well, better safe than sorry, and it turned out that was not the case, but again, that could have just been the propellant from the outgoing missile. We have seen streaks outgoing, we heard the a bang, but as Carl said, there's no hard evidence that anything was hit. We know what we saw, but we can't speculate about what was in it or what it was. And so far, uh, there's been no evidence that uh, the Iraqis have been able to use chemical warheads in, in any of these studs. Yeah, I'm, I'm very concerned about chemicals. It's certainly well taken. Uh, I've been through oh, at least three or four uh, breathing fires. Gentlemen. Gentlemen. Yes, yes. Excuse me for breaking in. Uh, Charles Jaco, Carl Rochelle. And earlier this year, you told us you had ordered your administration to cease and desist on payments to journalists 
uh, to promote your agenda. You cited the need for uh, ethical concerns and the need for a bright line between the press and the government. Your administration continues to make the use of video news releases, which are prepackaged news stories sent to television stations, fully aware that some or many of these stations will air them without any disclaimer that they are produced by the government. Controller General of the United States this week said that raises ethical questions. Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? Uh, there, there is a Justice Department opinion that says these, um, these pieces are within the law so long as they're based upon facts, not advocacy. And I expect our agencies to adhere to that ruling, to that Justice Department opinion. This has been a long-standing practice of the federal government to use uh, these uh, types of videos. The Agricultural Department, as I understand, has been using these videos for a long period of time. The Defense Department, other departments have been doing so. It's important that, the, that they be based upon the guidelines set out by uh, the Justice Department. Now, I also I think it'd be helpful if local stations then disclose to their viewers if that's you know that this was based upon a factual report and they chose to use it but evidently in some cases that's not the case so anyway to guarantee that's happening by including that language in the prepackaged report yeah i don't you know look, I mean, oh you mean a disclosure i'm george w bush and i well some way to make sure it couldn't air without the disclosure that you believe is so vital uh you know ken i mean there's a there's a procedure that we're going to follow, and the local stations ought to, if there's a deep concern about that, ought to tell their viewers what they're watching. Nineteen ninety two was a year of kings. There was the LAPD beating of Rodney King, videotaped from an apartment balcony, and the hovering coverage of TV cameras and helicopters circling the city as the public rebelled. It was nearly twenty five years after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, and Bill Clinton, a child of the sixties, was campaigning to become commander in chief, a king among the contenders. Hold on just a minute, here's Larry King. Hello? Then there was Larry King, who was anointed as the father of talk show democracy because TV viewers could phone his program and ask the candidates questions on the air. The viewer calls to King's show was seen as a seat of a future TV democracy in which citizens could vote for a candidate or pending legislation by picking up a special remote control and voting yes or no. Taking viewer calls on Larry King's show is TV evangelist Pat Robertson, whose organization, the Christian Coalition, seeks working control of the Republican Party by 1996. I'd like to ask Mr. Robertson two quick questions. One, what he thought about the Bush quail commercials. Were they effective? Should they have had more family values on them? Also, how can you say you want a party of inclusion when you're so blatantly anti-gay? Behind the scenes and off the air, Robertson's media advisor tells Robertson how to turn around or spin the caller's question. Well, I am moved. I want a kinder and gentler nation. This Bush campaign phrase was written by spin doctor and speechwriter Peggy Noonan. Because America is so infused by media that we are all spinning in a way. Uh, that it is, that it is... We're uh, embellishing our story. Uh, embellishment is okay. There's... Uh, What's not okay? Where does, uh, where does spin the begin? The disingenuous part. The, the calculating this isn't the whole truth part. If he tries to corner you on the can and do the same thing, slide off it, go back to the inclusion. Mm. 
got to get you got to expand the party and you got to bring everybody together you can't worry about the problems of 1992 you got to look ahead to 96 mm -hmm. focus on the future I so to speak you see Paul. Anyone with a home satellite TV system, like the ones you see in bars or in people's yards, could have picked up Robertson and his spin doctor chatting off air. Dish owners are able to receive two types of TV. One is the regular TV programming you normally see on cable or the broadcast networks. Is that uh, Helmstead still the next one? The other type of TV is the satellite feed, in this case the feed of George Bush and Larry King chatting during a commercial break. Kind of weird being seen around the world. Yeah. Technology. It's amazing. Saddam Hussein is watching this dream. Satellite feeds are used by the networks to transmit images of news events from around the world. An event covered by the network is transmitted up into space to a satellite. The satellite receives and retransmits the image of the event back down to Earth to the network's headquarters where the video image is edited and contextualized as television. The home satellite dish owner can watch regular TV, or they can tune in the satellite feed and see the event before it has been packaged by the networks as television. In 1992, I bought a couple of satellite dishes and spent the entire year flipping through the channels looking for feeds. I'd lock onto a satellite and go channel by channel through its transmission, recording the feeds. Then I would move on to the next satellite and the next one, and the next one. By the end of the year, I had recorded more than 500 hours of feeds. Don't put a lot of that garbage on it. What is this? Are we on the national? Can we turn that on? I don't want to be on national television being just um, made up. We're just turning the camera away from so Some of the feed guests knew, and some didn't know, their images were being broadcast, unscrambled and visible, to over three and a half million dish owners across North America. Those who knew they were being watched attempted to stay out of satellite TV's wide frame. But after spending hours a day inside of a television studio, television had become their home. Nineteen ninety one and ninety two had been years of political extremes for George Bush. After the Gulf War in nineteen ninety one, he had the highest approval rating of any president in modern history. But as the U.S. economy fell, so did Bush's ratings and his health. He and the First Lady Barbara Bush developed a thyroid condition known as Graves' disease. As Bush's ratings fell further, he decided to appear on Larry King's show. His appearance marked the first time a U.S. president had been on a call and talk show in over 15 years. You feeling well, by the way? Yeah. Are you feeling well? Yeah, lucky. Running still and play tennis yesterday. What is that disease you have? Uh, um, Crohn's? No, not Crohn's. Uh, just thyroid. I don't know what it's like. What have. are they? They, they drug treat it, right? They can take the drug every single morning. A little blue stem, Synthroid or something. And it wasn't hard. It's what the, it's what the thyroid does make your heart fibrillate, which has been very good. Now, I took Halcyon for a long time after my heart surgery. Are you often active? I don't know that it's bad. Right? It's the best sleeping pill in the world, but not daily. No, oh no. Okay. Now it's getting such a bad rap. Halcyon had gotten such a bad rap that its product license in Britain was provisionally withdrawn. Some users of the drug complained of amnesia, anxiety, delusions, and hostility. When Bush started the election year, he was taking a sedative during a visit to Japan when he fainted and threw up on the Japanese prime minister. For Bush, the image of the event could have been devastating. News stories of Jimmy Carter's fainting created a symbol of a failed president. It haunted Carter throughout his campaign and helped Ronald Reagan reach the White House. The first minute of Bush's fainting episode and the reaction of the frightened dinner guest was not released by the networks and is not seen here. 
Only this footage after the initial fainting was made public. Newsweek magazine published a story about the event with photographs from the censored Bush fainting episode, but the photographs obscured the view of the president's face. All traces of Bush's nauseating performance would be cleaned up by the White House television crew. Even this mantle photo of Bush's face next to a white baby's blanket may have looked too much like his face in Barbara's white napkin in Japan. You want to take one of the, Anna? You got it. Do whatever you need to do. I, so to speak. I don't. This is the White House television studio, the satellite TV hub, which the president used to make news. From the White House studio, Bush would go up on a satellite give a five-minute interview with a local news anchor, disconnect, hook up with another local news anchor, give an interview, disconnect, hook up with another one, and do this again and again and again. This type of satellite whistle-stop campaigning is called the satellite tour. This is a technician at the White House hooking up with TV stations in South Carolina and Florida for a satellite tour by Barbara Bush. Channel 4, do you read us in Washington? WYFF. Come in, come in. Remember that every single man, woman, and child in the state of South Carolina awakens to a freer, safer world because of George Bush. WIS, do you hear us in Washington? I would remind people that every single morning we all awaken to a safer, freer world because of George Bush. WCBD, do you hear us in Washington? And Nicole, I would remind you and the people of Florence that all of us awaken every single day to a freer, safer world because of George Bush. WCSC, do you read us in Washington? They themselves awaken every single day to a freer, safer world because of George Bush. Campaigning via the satellite tour allowed the candidates to cover long distances. But there was another major benefit. They could bypass the national TV networks. There was no need to feed through the TV network center and on to the local stations. The campaign was now the center and its own television network. This is great. I love these. Can we do any more? Can we do some now? Can we do those two now? Got to do some more flying in Texas. Have we done all of Colorado today? Yeah, we got one more done. Today. Another way the candidates made news was by creating their own TV news stories called the video news release. The video news release was given free of charge to local TV stations. Sent via satellite by the candidate. The video news release consisted of a campaign-produced TV news segment, complete with intro text for the local TV anchor to read, and a news story edited by the campaign. I feel I have the experience and leadership to take America in new directions. One new direction, Job Training 2000, Mr. Bush's plan to retrain blue-collar workers and the unemployed for new job opportunities. The country's 11 largest business organizations endorsed. Nearly all the major candidates placed a video news release on local television, and nearly half the local TV stations which aired the releases didn't report that they had been produced by the candidate. For instance, this story's reporter, Michael Caputo, wouldn't be identified as working for the Bush campaign. Primaries March 17th. In Washington, this is Michael Caputo reporting. The campaigns had to pay out of their own pockets to produce the satellite media tours and video news releases. But their best and cheapest way of making news was through the TV talk shows. And the candidate's talk show of choice was CNN's Larry King Live, which made the front page of the New York Times 57 times during the election year. 
Well, Al Gore was famous, Tammy. <laughs> he, on his book tour, he drove over to the Mutual Network all by himself, came up in that great Crystal City elevator. I still remember the day I became famous. Yeah. When your column in USA Today came in. On that thing, on that book. <laughs> I always remember the card you sent me. For the networks, making news meant making profits, as the candidates made nearly 100 talk show appearances. Tell Bill if he'd do that thing in New York, it'd be terrific. He's so good at this. Clinton. Yeah, yeah. One of the problems with staying on a bus too long is the two of you guys are so good on me. Towards the end of the election, candidate appearances increased TV talk show ratings an average of 40%. You know what you ought to do? You ought to come out on the uh, bus. bus trip with us uh, one day. We could do a, we could do a joint uh, interview from the bus. Larry King said the campaign ratings bonanza turned the election into a TV miniseries like Roots or the Thorn Birds. We're out of time. You can invite us on the bus. Okay. Uh, we have plum run out of time. Thanks for coming, Al. I I'd like to invite you to come on the bus with us. 1992 was probably an historic first, as a major network's advertising revenues from its political coverage made more money than it cost to report the campaign. For CNN, the election was a watershed, as the network received its highest ratings since the Gulf War. Well, I wanted to finish the thought here. That's the one break we have to hit live. It's, it's an around-the-world break. Hard to believe we're being watched in 151 yeah, no. countries. It's scary. I go, I'm in Israel, I'm at the Wailing Wall. True story, Israel, never been there before. They were my brother. I'm Jewish, it's my culture. Stand there, there's an old rabbi, dominating. He's praying, he's an old, a religious Jewish man. He looks up at me and he says, what's with Perot? <laughs> I swear to God, what's with Perot? In Israel. I love it. <laughs> it's crazy. Ted Turner changed the world. He's a big fan of yours. Is he? He would uh, serve you, Pastor. Um, I don't okay. know. I'm really surprised. He's ready. What's he, gonna, what's he got left in life to gain? I, you know, after you're elected. No. Think about it. No dope. That's for sure. <laughs> Great guy to work for, too. So to speak. Amid a continuing allegations of tabloid reports pointing to extramarital affairs, Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton is this noon campaigning across the South. Hello, Mike. Everybody in America who's had problems in their marriage, you either wound up divorced or who got back together votes for me. I'm a shoe in Can you hear me? I figure if everybody in Maryland who's ever had trouble in their marriage and they're still together or who's ever been divorced votes for me, I'm a shoe in uh, Hello? And you know, if every American couple who's either been divorced or had problems and stayed married votes for me, I'm a shoe in for re-election. I think the American people are smarter than the pundits. Before Clinton was shooed into office, he had to compete against a host of other Democratic candidates. The media focused on four of these candidates, but Larry Agron was a fifth candidate the press did not report on. There's no makeup here? During the 1992 U.S. Conference of Mayors, the New York Times reported that, quote, dozens of mayors seem to agree on one thing. The single candidate who truly understands urban needs is Larry Agron, unquote. He promised to bring this stuff over. None of the networks mentioned Agron's presence at the convention. One of Agron's staff had to run over to the Super Saver and buy some makeup because the network had broken its promise to provide it. This was typical of the media's treatment of Agron. When he appeared at this Democratic candidate's forum, this Associated Press photo simply cropped Agron out of the frame. 
During the New Hampshire primary, the TV news reported the polling numbers of the top five Democratic candidates, Brown, Clinton, Harkin, Kerry, and Songus. When Agron moved into a three-way tie with Harkin and Brown with 2% of the vote, most of the TV news didn't mention Agron. The day Bill Clinton captured what may have been the most valuable airtime of the entire election as he spoke to 50 million viewers about his alleged affair was the same day that a poll showed Agron's support at 4%. He had passed Brown and was the fifth leading candidate. When ABC's Sunday Evening News reported this poll, they simply deleted Agron entirely by not reporting his candidacy. During the New Hampshire primary, Agron's only live commercial TV appearance was through this satellite feed to ABC's Nightline. But the Nightline program wasn't directly about the election. When Agron complained to news executives about his lack of coverage, he was told he had not earned the right to media exposure because he had not received enough media exposure. And on stage, the five major contenders for the Democratic presidential nomination. Although Agron was on the ballot in nearly half the country, he was barred from most televised debates, including this one sponsored by the League of Women Voters. He couldn't meet one of the League's main criteria, which was, quote, recognition by the national media as a candidate meriting media attention, unquote. Good evening and welcome to the Democratic presidential candidates debate on urban America. Agron wanted to debate on urban America, calling for a 50 percent cut in defense spending and the reinvestment of some of that money into America's decaying cities. We are going to be coming to you rather live from Lehman College and you'll hear a bit of a disturbance in the background, but we'll go on with that in any case. The disturbance is Larry Agron asking to be included in the debate so that he can explain his plans for defense cuts and urban revitalization. Bronxboro President Ferdinand Ferrer and Mr. President, I suggest you wait for just a moment till the man is quieted or chooses to quiet down. I respectfully request inclusion. All right, Mr. Mr. Ferrer. Agron was quickly arrested. His court date fell on the first day of the Democratic National Convention. During this campaign, but very little said about the problems facing America's cities. Tonight, we'll change all that. Without media exposure and the debates, Agron couldn't quickly receive federal campaign funds, and his candidacy lost momentum. Uh, you look all right on camera. What's that? You look all right, there's no hot spots. So. Really? Okay. Wait a second, a mustache that shows through here. Okay, Why don't you go get some stuff, Mike? Go to go to oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Campaign funds. The Democratic Party refused to include Agron in the debates or speak to the networks on his behalf. Agron talked about his exclusion, saying, I've challenged my own party for its continuing complicity in Cold War thinking, Cold War rhetoric, and Cold War budgets. To restore order right now, there are 3,000 National Guardsmen on duty in the city of Los Angeles. Another 2,200 stand ready to provide immediate support. I, so to speak. Okay. Uh, you see? Fall. So to speak. Fall. You see? Fall. Oh, what a beautiful night. In 1992, the networks had their own solutions for urban decay. This morning, we are here looking for solutions. CBS looked for solutions at L.A.'s Martin Luther King Hospital. Well, a hospital like Martin Luther King can see more trauma than all of Western Europe does in a year. Mm. In fact, there's so much trauma there that the U.S. Army sends its combat surgeons there so they get a sense of what these very severe fear wounds were like. In fact, when I was in the Gulf War, a number of the senior combat surgeons had trained right here at Martin Luther King mm -hmm. Hospital. Dr. Bob, thanks. Before he went on air, part of Dr. Bob's diagnosis was cut out because it was too obtuse. Yeah, so what's your impression? Because my impression is, you know, places like South Central LA, around the country, look more and more like real third world countries, or third world countries without the hope. That is, they have no medical care, they have no real economy, and, um, they, and yet, in the third world country, it's developing. There's some onward development. There's some vision for the future. What about your, your impressions of the medical care are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I think it's too obtuse. How about, how about if I were to ask, 
ask about the level of the, the trauma care. Cuba's 30. always been considered superior, has it not, to other parts of the country? Good. Yeah, 30 seconds. Yeah, it's the best, the best. You know, Guys, why don't I say something like that? Okay. As the conditions of the cities became obtuse to the networks, they turned to the suburbs to render a verdict on the campaign. And later, I on the campaign, you will see and hear some of the suburban voters who may very well decide this election. Back now live from St. Louis, there is news far beyond this city tonight. In, uh, what is this, in Hawaii? Haiti. In Haiti, oh, oh, oh. well, they all look alike. Huh? In Haiti, a huge explosion leveled a three-story building in downtown Port-au-Prince. At least 15 Haitians were killed. Take a look at the roads leading into and out of Los Angeles. Lately, you see more taillights than headlights. A lot of people leaving this town for good. Where are they going? Anywhere else. Why? While the ethnically diverse cities were abandoned for the homogeneous suburbs, the networks created their own recipes for the melting pot. Make a note. Give it to Kathy, who may be the best at this. Since we're going to wish uh, people a happy Rosh Hashanah, which is my idea and a good idea, just don't forget to check when Ramadan is. We have to wish all of our Muslim friends happy Ramadan. And then behind that, when you get to the Buddhist New Year, the year of the rat or the year of the monkey, whatever it is, we have to... We want to, we've got to be politically correct here, pal. After four Los Angeles police officers were found not guilty of assaulting Rodney King, the TV news moved away from the residents of L.A. and into the sky with 13 television-equipped helicopters. Of justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. I'm sorry, we're, we're still hung up in our court here. Um, they're just marching up and down the streets, and they formed a big bulkhead here at the end of the, at the corner. The distant coverage in the sky was emulated on the ground by the scarce street reporters who tried to glide by without speaking to the protesters of the verdict. With the chants, no justice, no peace is what they're chanting. No peace! No justice, no peace! You can hear them now. No justice, no peace! We can still go in here. No peace! No justice, no peace! No justice, no peace! No justice, no peace! No justice, no, no peace. No peace. We ain't this got nothing to say. This should never have been a change, people. This should never have been a change of venue. No justice. This no should peace. never have been a change no of venue. No and as a result, no this is what you have. This is what you have. There's no clips down here. There's no bloods down here. There's just concerned citizens down here that don't like the way the system is done. This is what we're talking about. Could you tell me, sir, could you tell me? Could you tell me? The police are closing in. They're cutting the law. Okay, that was our last. You did that. They cut us. Huh? They cut us when you did that. Uh -huh. No justice. No peace. The voiceless scenes from South Central L.A., where nearly 50 percent of the children live in poverty, was contextualized by the $600,000 a year TV news anchors. As the looting goes on in a senseless fashion. People arguing for sanity on the one hand, simultaneous looting in a random fashion for things that people can't even use. 25 years ago, the media's coverage of the riots in the Watts area of Los Angeles was called racially divisive by the federally empowered Kerner Commission. The commission was formed in order to find the root causes of the urban violence of the late 1960s. It found that one cause was the massive economic collapse and poverty of the cities. The other was the media. The Kerner Commission found the media guilty of failing to communicate to all ethnic groups the complex and fundamental problems of race relations. This L.A. news anchor made these comments moments before reporting the verdict in the second LAPD beating trial of Rodney King. Okay, I'm standing by, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have shit to say. We don't have anything to do. But by God, the management of this company deems it necessary that I come on the shut the shit out of all of you. In just half an hour from now, the jury in the federal Rodney King beating trial will be back in session. The Kerner Commission said media's failure to communicate was caused in part by the media's shockingly backward hiring practices. Hardly any people of color worked as TV news directors, the people who set policy and make decisions. 
Television responded to the criticism by hiring cameramen, clerks, and makeup artists that were African American, Latino, and Asian American. For each of these ethnic groups, the number of TV news directors is a few percentage points above zero since the Kerner Commission's verdict 25 years ago. You, you announced that they get rid of their gates tomorrow and they'll stop tomorrow. You announced that. As the networks covered over the voices from LA, the candidates told the story of their own. I felt anger. I felt pain. I thought, how can I explain this to my grandchildren? And given the fact that this is a presidential election year, it's also a challenge to the man who would challenge the president for the country's leadership. Of course, everyone knows the old rhyme. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. We know his voyage took him to the New World, and his arrival changed the world forever. But beyond that, much about Columbus remains the subject of some dispute. During the celebration of the 500th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of the Americas, the only satellite feed I found with a Native American guest was this feed to a local morning talk show. The guest is a historian and a member of the Cherokee Nation. You said he presided over the over death of a quarter of a million people. No, that yeah. wasn't at his own hand. That was well, others who followed him and over, disease over, and that sort of thing. No, he couldn't control, no I'm it? talking about like his first two years here, a quarter of a million. It's pretty well documented. He took uh, his interpreters, he took his, his guides as slaves. Uh, he chopped off the hands of anyone over 14, any male over 14 who couldn't bring him gold. He took women as sex slaves for his men. Dr. Matei, I want you to thank you very much for coming by. Thanks for spending some time with us this morning on the Good Morning Show. You're welcome. That was brief. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully painless, sir. The painful lessons of Columbus's past were never mentioned as the networks debated his legacy. Interesting debate. I'm not sure we settled it this morning, but we'll we appreciate on. trying. That's we'll true. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you. And we'll be back with more of our special edition of today on Governor's Island right after this. What do he say to many cents? Anything? They just, you know, think that he yeah, ruined right. the paradise and had no respect for nature and treated the Indians like dog do and... What the hell is he doing? Okay. I can't so speak. I think I'm pregnant. The woman on the screen is Murphy Brown, a fictional TV sitcom character. It doesn't help matters when primetime TV has Murphy Brown. He is talking about he you. Today's intelligent, highly paid... Vice President Dan Quill blamed the L.A. riots on its citizens' lack of family values, instilled in part by the Murphy Brown TV character. He said it was not economic poverty, but rather a poverty of values promoted by the Brown character, which caused the burning of L.A. Highly paid professional woman, <laughs> mocking the importance of fathers by bearing a child alone and calling it just another lifestyle choice. Politicizing sexuality was not new to Washington. I'm an executive producer. I'll just executive produce this baby. Sexual politics helped Ronald Reagan reach the White House and gave birth to the new religious right. <laughs> After the Republicans lost the presidency to Jimmy Carter, some conservatives theorized if the Republican Party would oppose abortion, they could split the strong Catholic voting bloc of the Democrats and elect a Reagan and Bush ticket to the White House. 
As a senator, George Bush was against outlawing abortion. But as Reagan's vice presidential running mate, Bush changed his position and supported a ban on abortion. Well, you haven't given us any specificity about where you stand on this, Senator. In the past, particularly in the House of Representatives, you voted against federal funding for abortions, and that meant for poor women. In some circumstances. Well, tell us the, the circumstances, please. All right. The, the circumstances debated have involved a rape and incest and life uh, where the life of the mother is in jeopardy. As a congressman, Al Gore voted against using federal funds for abortion. But as a vice presidential candidate, he changed his position and supported using federal funds for abortion as part of the Clinton health care plan. That's what freedom is all about. That's what tolerance is all about. That's what our country stands for. Well, I, I'm still confused. I'll try one more time. When you voted against federal funding for abortions, <clears throat> except under the three circumstances you outlined, had your vote carried the day, you would have imposed your belief on poor women in this country. There was no and there is no national health insurance program today. Uh, we do not have the kind of comprehensive coverage. After the abortion questions, Gore's media advisor tells him how to turn around or spin the A question. And the president of the Christian Broadcasting Network, Mr. Pat Robertson. The 1992 Republican National Platform called for a complete ban on abortion. Nearly 30% of the platform committee was controlled by the Christian Coalition and its president, Pat Robertson. The goal of Robertson's Christian Coalition is to gain working control of the Republican Party by 1996. I have two television networks, I have three radio news networks, I'm starting Standard News, I have 50 uh, reporters right now working for me that are very fine. Robertson's reporters work for its Christian Broadcasting Network, or CBN. Through the 700 Club, CBN News reports reach over 43 million homes in the U.S. Operation Rescue has targeted five abortion clinics in Buffalo for a minimum of two weeks of activities aimed at shutting the facilities down. In 1992, Operation Rescue was a top news story for CBN. A battle both sides vow to win. Andrea Francis, CBN News. On the first day of the Republican National Convention, Operation Rescue broke through this line of clinic defenders and blockaded an abortion clinic near the convention site. <laughs> That same day, Robertson had this discussion with a CBN staff person. I have sent word to Operation Rescue. I don't want one word on this program this week about Operation Rescue. Well, not we're, we're one. not. We're not. I don't want to cover it. I don't want to talk about it. And I want to hear. That same morning, Republicans who supported women's right to choose an abortion held a rally in Houston led by Ann Stone. And I will go over the I mean, we felt like we should cover it. In, in Don't the cover anything about the abortion debate any longer. It doesn't matter. matter. They passed the platform. Yeah. We yeah. need to get cameras covering our rally. Our oh, we're there. Like we're going to be there. And, and, uh, does it start? Uh, and then you need cameras it's shooting time for Stephen President George Bush or me sitting in the vice president's spot. But I believe in objective news. I believe in balanced news. I don't want to slant the news. I just want to tell it like it is. How many cameras? Just yeah, drop those camera crews. We have two. Yeah. Get two reporters. And just take those cameras from the face of anybody you want to. And just start asking the questions. Hey, Luke. Ask the tough questions. Ask the tough questions. I let them know right now we haven't seen you. Yeah. 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 Ye
I mean, get out there, don't even say anything. You know, the chairman will just go from the What do you think is the president of the New York Times? You think this thing is breaking up? There might be a military gimmick. You think that's a election? I mean, stick it to it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and Cameron, wait in their face. Sam, go up and ask your question. Boom. I'm sure it didn't on the radio. We'll do. We'll do it. We play hardball. We play hardball. I'm not sure that point is going to go Televangelists play some of their hardest ball at the expense of the gay community by using the AIDS crisis. One fifty-two seven ninety-six. It was the squeaker, but we made it. And the totals are going. By 1985, viewers were giving an estimated 100 million dollars a year to Robertson's TV program. When televangelist Jim Baker was sent to prison for mail fraud and Jimmy Swaggart was caught with a prostitute, fewer donations to televangelism plummeted. A lot of uh, broadcasters are gone. Some needed to, some it was financial pressure. Televangelist Jerry Falwell's ministry was nearly bankrupt. Then he sent out a fundraising letter which claimed AIDS-infected homosexuals were purposely infecting citizens by knowingly giving their AIDS-infected blood to blood banks. In the fundraising letter, Falwell said, quote, they know they are going to die and they are going to take as many people with them as they can, unquote. His ministry was revived. Seventy-five years ago, a plague descended upon the world and covered the nations of Eastern Europe like a dark cloud. But ladies and gentlemen, a more benign but equally insidious plague has fastened itself upon the families of America. At the Republican National Convention, Robertson characterized communism and government bureaucracies as plagues, a thinly veiled reference to the AIDS crisis. Robertson supports the theory that gays have conspired with other supposedly subversive agents in order to undermine the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, the carrier of this plague is the Democrat Party. Um, that Republican convention was one of the most hateful things. I'm a Republican, but I'll tell you what, Pat Robertson personally was one of the reasons why I voted against George Bush. Okay, now Pat, he's saying you would not let a pro-choice person chair your party, or you would try to stop it. He just uh, contradicted what I just said. I'm sitting here in this chair telling you something different, and he said I won't do How does he know what I'll do? Uh, I, I think... Uh, uh, if he obviously didn't hear my speech at the convention because it closed with a beautiful story of a lovely lady holding a little uh, a starving child in her arm and uh, it was a call uh, for a, a better world and, and one nation under God. I can't see how anybody said that was hateful. I don't know where he's coming from, but there's something there that is not uh, just on the surface, I think, because I didn't say the things he said I did. We'll be right back with Pat Robertson and Lynn Martin and more of your phone calls on Larry King Live, then Tina Sinatra. Don't go away. Um, that guy was on the wall. Yeah, he sure, sure, alive. He didn't grab it. You take the one sentence, turn it around. You're answering the question. Okay. You yeah. can talk about anything you want to. Yeah. What, what's that? Did you get a good question? No. This last one is. Well, last one, I, but yeah, I, I didn't well, get I said, it. Who in the heck is screening these calls? I've had one person call a bigot. I've had another person call a zealot. Let's let's get some balance out there. Well, the last one's too late. Uh -huh. The last one's okay, but the first three were all homosexuals. I know. I know. I've had you, this you before. Can answer, you can answer the question any way you choose to. I hear you. All right. Remember, so take take it where you want it to go. Take it where you want it to go. I don't like the producer of this segment. Well, they, it's, uh, they were trying to set me up. Yeah. That's what they told me. And that's what the Harris people told me. Did, did they accomplish it, or, or have I come back on? No, I think you're fine. I think that I'm just very upset. Yeah. That they were it was, it was, well. You have, it hasn't come to us on the face as well. Angry. Oh, no, I'm not angry. Who's angry? You look good. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sure it's a certain thing. 
I think they'll be out of here in about another. I hear you. You're right. I, so to speak. According to research and polls on the 1992 election, the information source which Americans valued more than TV news and TV talk shows was the presidential debates. And this would mean that there would be four televised presidential debates, more than ever held in any presidential election. And if Governor Clinton is serious about debating, he will accept this challenge, and he will instruct his campaign officials to meet promptly with my campaign officials to work out the de details directly between the parties. Let's get it on. Bill, baby, let's do it. Get it on, as we say. Let's get up there and get it on, side by side. Sunday night, Mr. Bush is going to go on Larry King Live. So what I think is, Larry King ought to have us both on there and let the American people call their questions in. That's what we ought to do. Then, then we get the best of both worlds, one moderator and millions of questioners. I think it would really be a great thing. So I've asked our people to contact Larry King and See if we can arrange it. I'm ready to go. Let's get it on. Hi, um, Tom, can you hear me? Yeah. They've just confirmed both sides. They're meeting at 8 o'clock tonight. Okay. Um, I think it's at Mickey's office. Malik, Teeter, Darman will attend for the president, and they have turned down Larry King. So I've rewritten my live lead. After Bush turned down Larry King's show as the site of the first presidential debate, the debate over who would be moderator of the debates continued, as seen in these satellite feeds, recorded over a 10-day period. Al looks great. You saw where he proposed you as the moderator of the debates. Who? What, didn't we? Uh, I think we did. Yeah. Oh, when, well, when, when he was going, when the yeah. president was going to be on I'd the be show. I'd be happy to be at it. That shocks me. <laughs> I, I think David, I think I'd be a fair amount of it. You'd get a very fair well, yep. I do too. I'm the fairest person, I think. I'll let you know. Right, right out. You're doing great. I will tell you. I'll be the first to tell you. Did they pick the journalist today for St. Louis? They picked the reporters. Not that yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. And I still think, you know, there's a lot of narrative. Who's on on Sunday night? We know yet. No, the moderator. I don't think we know yet. No, it hasn't been chosen. But you have input. They have input. Pro has input. That's correct. Right up my alley. That stuff right up my alley. No one would get it in the edge. What's that? Be fair. You'll sit best in the debates. Because you don't come with any baggage. You could elevate it. Every time we talk about something silly, you say, come on. What are we wasting time? To me. Yeah. You sit very effective. You could affect, have a great effect on this life. Just let's go get it on. Get it on, so to speak. King was never chosen as a moderator of the debates. Good evening and welcome to the second of three presidential debates between the major candidates for president of the United States. So, President Bush, I think you said it earlier, let's get it on. Good morning. The latest presidential polls show President Bush is closing in on Bill Clinton in the final week before the election. One poll shows the two candidates are almost even. A CNN USA Today poll shows Clinton and Bush virtually deadlocked. Four days before the election, George Bush made his final appearance as president on Larry King's show. 
What a night, what a finish. What a year for me. Yeah, a year for me, it's been unbelievable. Changed the world. It's um, different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Strangest year in the history of me. <laughs> I hear you, Tom. Tell me about it. What? Tell me about it. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Right ahead, a historic evening. 90-minute special, Larry King Live, with the President of the United States and your phone calls. It's next from Racine, Wisconsin. Don't go away. <laughs> My brother's in the pharmaceutical business. He says there's a new pill coming from Israel, better than housing. You mean for sleeping or beats his Great. Right. I... So to speak. It's now uh, shortly after 9 o'clock, and the East Poles are still open in the West, of course, in the Mountain Time Zone as well. Here's a winner in the Rocky Mountain states, Colorado. Eight electoral votes. Perot was a big factor. Taking away Three years after Bush's defeat, the Christian Coalition tripled its active membership to one and a half million members. Clinton's taken New Mexico, according to them. Its annual budget has more than doubled, and the coalition holds a virtual veto power over the Republican nominee for president in 1996. Rhode Island, Delaware, unbelievable. Mr. Roberts, would you like to or reorganize the Republican Party around the Christian tenets that you hold so dear? I would like to see a winning coalition like Ronald Reagan had. I think we've got to get economic conservatives together with social conservatives and some who are foreign policy advocates of the foreign policy initiatives that we've seen very successfully over the last 10 or 12 years and to put together that coalition. And I, I think that uh, the last thing we need is recrimination and finger pointing and that sort of thing. It's good. The Republican Party will probably have a splendid opportunity uh, if we have some economic collapse in the next two or three years to come back strong in 96. Pat Robertson, thank you very much. Thanks. Frank Gumbel? Tom, that's the closest we've seen to the start of uh, what might be a, a round of finger pointing. Uh, how much of it do you think we are going to see? Well, I think that the Pat Robertson movement, and he's not the only one who's involved in it, is very important and to some Republicans a little terrifying right now because they're very well organized. He says we're very important and very well organized in county by county. Yes, the new religious run. They'll, they'll organize out of sight of the conventional machinery and then go out and win. It was reported after the election that the Clinton White House uses the Department of Defense to intercept satellite TV feeds on a regular basis. This monitoring practice started during the 1992 election, as Al Gore's wife, Tipper, found out during the campaign. Everyone's watching you on Little Rock. They're watching these satellite feeds? Oh, yeah, we can, 
you know, that we, we pull it whenever any of you all do a satellite tour, they pull it down on Little Rock on all the monitors and the whole headquarters. Just the actual interviews, not this right. part. The Clinton campaign also intercepted the satellite feeds of the TV network news. Clinton strategists would watch the network's satellite feed of a network news story about Clinton. This would give the strategists the ability to respond to the story before it ever aired on regular network television. Clinton the school is almost within reach. Clinton's trying to lift his sights beyond the attack colleges. Four years. Feeling that his goal is almost within reach, Clinton is now trying to lift his sights beyond the attack politics of the campaign. Clinton also monitored the satellite feeds of his opponents. According to the American Journalism Review, the Clinton campaign intercepted the satellite feed of a Bush commercial 36 hours before the commercial aired on network television. But here's what Clinton economics could mean to you. $1,088 more in taxes. $2,072 more in taxes. By intercepting the feed, Clinton strategists had the ability to respond to Bush's ad before the ad had ever aired. Four years ago, he asked you to believe him. Read my lips. Now he's asking you to believe his attacks against Bill Clinton. This is a satellite feed of a Clinton rally. The person you just heard speaking was probably one of Clinton's security team standing near an open microphone on the stage. The instructions he was giving may have come from Clinton's staff in Little Rock, which regularly monitored the feeds of Clinton's rallies. Little Rock would watch the satellite feed of the Clinton camera slowly panning the audience like a surveillance camera. If they saw a protester at the public event, Little Rock could call the rally site to alert security. But whenever we did a, a live satellite feed of like a big rally or something, it was a really very interesting instance. The Buffalo rally, there were some protesters. Mm -hmm. And Little Rock is all where the advanced station, people couldn't keep them the backstage. So the desk, the white desk class, called the advanced people on the phone and said, you know, walk 10 feet to the left, there's a sign and the camera shot there, edge that guy over. I mean, so it's like Little Rock directed Buffalo and watched it dismantle on television. And they watched the dismantling of a problem. Well, right. And they, you know, where the advanced person is in a sea of 2,000 oh, right, people, right, right. Little Rock was able to say, Move to, I can see you on TV, now go two people over to your left. It's really very fascinating. Hmm. High tech. Yeah, that's good. Um, so that's why when they said there are shadows in your face, that was Little Rock calling saying there are shadows on your face. Oh. Yeah. See, everybody watches it. 